Hi, I'm Matthew Allard from Newshooter.com. I'm Eric Nazo with Newshooter.com, and you are listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, we recap NAB 2019 with Matthew Allard and Eric Naso of Newshooter.com. We dive deep into the most important announcements for cameras, lenses, lights, audio, grip gear, and keyboards. Yes, we said keyboards. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera. Buy, rent, create at rule.com. Hedge.video, the fastest way to backup media, Shutterstock.com, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. Well, NAB was wild. It was so much fun. I want to thank all the people over at Atomos for having me there, MC their entire week of panels and events. I met so many great people, saw so much cool gear, and I just loved it. So I hope to do it again next year. Uh, but there's so much news to talk about, and that's why we have this episode here. We've got Eric Naso and Matthew Allard from Newshooter.com to come on and talk about their experience at NAB and all of the gear information that we need to know. And that's coming up just a couple of minutes. But I want to bring your attention to one thing. We want to know from you what you think of the show. And we're going to give you a $100 gift card for doing it. Now, here's the thing. Head over to our website, GoCreativeShow.com, click on Survey, And let us know what you think of the show. We want to hear from you. What are we doing well? What can we do better? And uh, we take that very, very serious. And this is a great time to hear from our audience. And by doing that, you automatically enter yourself into a contest to win a $100 gift card from B&H. So it is a win for us. It's a win for you. And we strongly suggest and hope that you go there and do it. So gocreativeshow.com. Click on survey. Let us know what you think of the show. Now, let's take a quick moment and talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule Boston Camera is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. So, hey, much of the things that we're talking about today, you can probably go and rent over at Rule. But it's not about their legendary inventory. It's not about their huge selection of lenses. It's about their service. When you work with Rule, you have a partner in this business. They've got your back. You're going to get expert advice and counsel in pre-production, You're going to get technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot, and they're committed to support you all throughout your production. And that sort of peace of mind is what I'm looking for when I am working with a uh, a rental company. I mean, it really is. Like I said, world-class inventory, uh, cameras, lighting, lenses, all communications, everything you need, it's all there, but it's the service that keeps me going back to Rule Boston Camera. I love those guys. Now, They're also committed to teaching our production community. And if you go to their website, you are faced with three buttons, buy, rent, learn. And I encourage you, just go to the learn button. You don't have to spend a dime and you get an opportunity to learn about all sorts of great stuff. They've got an entire video catalog of uh, hands-on demos and presentations and all the things that they've been doing in the past and are doing in the future are all there in the learn section at rule.com. So whether you live in Boston, whether you have not one cent to your name, you just want to learn about the industry, it's all there at rule, Boston camera, rule.com. Click on learn and learn some stuff. All right, we've got a big episode, guys. So let's dive right in with Matthew Allard and Eric Naso from newshooter.com talking about NAB 2019. So I'm here with Matt Allard and Eric Naso from newshooter.com talking all about NAB 2019. And I have to say, uh, first of all, welcome to the show, guys. It's been a while, so I hope you're doing well. Uh, But I don't know what's been going on with newshooter.com, but your site is getting better and better and more and more thorough. The articles are longer. I'm obsessing more over the website. I'm spending more time on the website. Why are you doing this to us? (laughs) It's Matt's fault. Lack of sleep. (laughs) It's good stuff. And, you know, Matt's really been uh, cranking out some great articles and reviews in the last several months, not that he hasn't been doing a great job before, but he's just, uh, I don't know. He's kind of like come, he's, he's morphing into this journalistic beast. <laughs> are you, are you spending, I mean, is this basically your full time all the time, Matt? No, not at all. Ne- neither of us are, are full time. This is still like a part time gig that we just do when we're not actually doing a real job. Jesus. How do you have the time <laughs> to do all of this? I mean, the articles are so in depth 
Especially, I mean, when you're doing gear reviews, it's like no one does gear reviews the way New Shooter does. You will look at every single aspect of it and obsess over it. And that is what we want. <laughs> I mean, clearly, the site's blowing up. And I think uh, it's really a testament to what you guys are doing in an age where everyone is doing gear reviews to stand out is really impressive. Well, I think it's just the, you know, we, we're concentrating on doing the 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 written articles rather than just a video. You know, you, it's very hard to go in depth doing a, a video because it could go for 45, 50 minutes. At least yeah. if you write it all down and you go through everything, then people have a reference when they can go back and, you know, they can have a look at a review or look at a piece of gear that they're interested in and find out, you know, every single aspect, what works, what doesn't work, what's good, what's bad. Well, let's dive right in because there is plenty of gear to talk about. I, I mean, you've got a, a nice handy link here that you sent me right on your website. It's kind of like an NAB 2019 uh, recap, and it's a great spot to kind of go and get direct links to uh, the stories that you guys have from NAB. So I'll encourage all the listeners to do that as well as we're playing along here. But I want to start with cameras. Why not? It's the reason we're all there. And uh, there were some camera announcement and some kind of interesting things there. I mean, I want to just quickly start with Alexa Mini LF. I think that's probably the biggest story aside from the Sharp 8K, but we kind of knew about that. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Alexa Mini LF. Um, you know, we don't need to dive super deep into everything here because there's a lot to cover, but curious what your thoughts are. I think it was always going to come. It was just a question of, of when. I think as soon as they uh, announced the Alexa LF, which was, uh, I think, February last year, um, I think everyone just expected that there was going to be a mini LF. I, I just think that maybe people were a little bit surprised how quickly Ari was able to uh, to come up with the camera. Yeah. Uh, it was very difficult from a, from a technical standpoint coming up with that camera, putting that large sensor in there, dealing with the heat. Um, initially when, you know, Ari approached their engineers and said, we want to build a, an Alexa mini LF, you know, there was a bit of silence in the room and the engineers were a bit, oh, I don't know if we can do this, but they eventually got around to doing it and it's out there. Um, I think it's going to be probably a lot more popular than the large Alexa LF. Uh, I don't think that is sold particularly well for Ari. Uh, it is starting to get a lot of use on, you know, big, productions and, and and major movies and things along those sort of lines. But I think the Alexa Mini LF uh, is bound to probably be a little bit more popular uh, in other realms like commercials and, uh, you know, places where the normal Alexa Mini was being used. But what was really interesting, um, you know, at the show is that I, I talked to Ari and I was more interested in the fact that they have already said that they're going to announce a new 4K camera early in 2020. This yeah. is sort of a bit of a shock. You don't really hear companies, especially Ari, coming out and saying, you know, we're going to announce a camera in a year. They don't just do that. Normally when they announce something, it's it's sort of, you know, nobody knows about it and out it comes. So this is a very interesting. I mean, I think it's very difficult now for rental houses because rental houses are now going, oh, okay, what do I do? Do I buy the Alexa Mini LF, or do I wait for this new, you know, 4K camera that's coming next year? And we have no idea what this camera is actually going to be, and we have no idea what sensor it's going to use because uh, it's it's unlikely that it's going to use the same sensor as the uh, as the LF uh, Alexa or Alexa Mini. So it could be a completely new sensor. So you know, everything's up in the air uh, as far as the whatever Ari is going to announce next year. I went into NAB thinking honestly. I was like. A couple of weeks before NAB, I'm like, this is the year I'm going to get either a Mini or I'm going to get a, an Amira. It's just going to happen. I was pricing it out, thinking about financing options. I go to NAB and I see their booth and I hear the announcements and I'm like, oh, Jesus, maybe I should wait. <laughs> like, and it's a <laughs> weird... NAB for you. <laughs> it, it really is. And it's, and it's just such a weird thing for them to do to announce because it does sort of... I think it's going to hurt the mini LF sales. But at the same time, you got to let the people shooting for Netflix know that you have a camera on the way. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much the play right there. Uh, I honestly, I think whatever Aerie does is, oh, it, the camera is going to have that that look, that specific look that you're after, because they've pretty much set the standard. When everybody chases the Aerie look, so 
You know, it does, it makes a lot of sense for them to make a 4K camera, but you know, I guess you got to kind of evaluate whether it makes a lot of sense for you to wait for it. And you know, the, the other options are probably going to be a little less expensive on the Airy side. Um, you know, the Airy, the, uh, the, the Alexa Mini was the best selling camera Airy ever made. You know, mm-hmm. so you know, it made a lot of sense to to make the LF uh, as it's, but it, I don't know if it'll be as successful as the uh, Alexa Mini. It's just. Uh, a little bigger, so more expensive. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, in in this day and age, unless you actually have to, you know, have that 4K delivery, you have to shoot in 4K, deliver in 4K. I don't know if, uh, you know, waiting is really necessary. I mean, the the Amira, which is a camera that Matt, you know, that's his bread and butter camera. Uh, I don't think he feels his camera right now is long in the tooth. <laughs> so I think it, you know, it just depends on, I guess, you know, the requir- the requirements for delivery might be more important than, than whether it's 4K, a new 4K camera from Aerie. Let's talk about another mini camera, even though it doesn't have the, uh, the name mini, but these Z cams, uh, mm. I- I've, I've heard of Z cam, never really paid too much attention to them, but um, they were right across from the Atomos booth, which is where I was the whole week long. So the whole week I'm sort of being tempted by them and, uh, they've got a 6k and an 8k camera at very, very inexpensive prices. And I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on what this whole Z cam thing is about. And it's got a lot of attention this year. It has. And actually, uh, I went to the booth, didn't really know a whole lot about Z cam. Uh, it was, I, I'd, I'd heard that they have a six and eight K camera coming out. So I figured I'd go over there and, and just really see it. And I actually have one uh, in for a review. It's an E2. So it's the micro four thirds 4k model. Uh, I've been shooting with it. Actually, I shot a promo with it yesterday for the station. So I felt pretty confident after doing some initial testing. Um, you color think? science is pretty well, color science is pretty good. Image is sharp. Um, it's not, you know, the, even the Rec 709 setting is, uh, is not real contrasty. You know, there's still a lot, of, a little bit of room there in the in the blacks and and uh, highlights. It 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 has kind of like that wide DR feeling from Canon. So you kind of get a little bit of space there, but you don't have to you know, overly grade it. Um, it seems to be performing quite well for a tiny little camera. It's very impressive. I would say like the only downside really right now is if you do have a lot of movement. I mean, I mean a lot of movement. You get a little bit of rolling shutter with these cameras. So. Uh, they're pushing that 4K sensor for sure. It does 120, 120 frames per second in full 4K with H.265. Now, it also does ProRes up to 60 4K, uh, which is fantastic because you don't have to use an external recorder, which is a huge benefit, especially for a small camera. You don't really want to use an external recorder. You want to keep things kind of small. But you do need a monitor, or you have to add a EVF because there is none. It's it's basically like a mini red camera. You know, I mean, like micro mini red camera. It's just a brain, yeah. and it does have audio inputs. It uses the uh, Alexa, uh, Area Alexa style mini uh, Limo connector. That's this, that's like the micro uh, XLR. Uh, it, it works and it comes well. out to like a little breakout, not a yeah, not a box, yeah. but it comes out to like a little breakout area. Yeah, I had to buy the cable. It came in like the day before the shoot, so I had about two hours to test it before I actually used it. I'm living on the edge over here. Oh, you're brave, know. yes. <laughs> I know. I was a little more braver than I should be. But uh, it worked fine. The audio was good. Uh, you have to go in the menu to set your levels, which is a little bit of a drag. But once you get them, you know, dialed in, it seems to be fine. So, uh, but yeah, my experience right now, I'd say, is pretty positive with the camera, and uh, I think the image quality looks really great. The color science, again, uh, nice. That's that's one of the most important things to me, actually, in a camera. It's like, you know, first and foremost, what does the color look like? And then everything else needs to fall in place after that. So and I think they're on the right path on that camera. And I'm really interested to see the 6K, 8K because they have a S35 and a full frame version in the pipeline. So that That is exciting for me. I, I do like S35 as a standard. Micro Four Thirds have been dabbling with those sensor cameras for a while and they have their they have their pluses and they have their minuses. And this little body to be able to have a S thirty five or you know, even a full frame sensor uh, with that color science and and those onboard codecs and some good frame rate options, 
Huh? And their price range, I think it's only like five grand they're looking at getting for these cameras. So the uh, E2 is uh, less than two thousand at one thousand nine ninety five. So uh, incredible what's happening with ZCam. Did you play with any high frame rate, or can you do it uh, with your with that version, the E2? E- yeah, I haven't shot. Uh, I haven't shot the one twenty yet. At one twenty at four K with H two six five, um, sixty looks really good. Uh, I have seen some samples online of 120, and I, you know how cameras tend to get softer. You know when they when they go into yeah, 120. Yeah. Um, from just the samples that I have seen, it doesn't look like it takes a hit in in uh, detail when you go to higher frame rates. But I haven't tested that yet, so I can't say that for sure. But from what I've seen, it looks pretty promising. And it looks like there's also an API. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's an SDK for this remote control option so that you can kind of, if you're the type of person that knows how to do this, I certainly am not, you can, exactly why I said the wrong thing at the beginning, but it's, you can somehow <laughs> control this camera manually if you're able to create this. But what yeah. I'm not totally yeah. clear on is, do they actually have an app too, or are they just opening it up and saying, hey, you guys can do whatever you want? Like, what's the interface with the phone? Yeah, and I haven't played too much with the interface yet on that, but you can definitely control the camera easily with, you know, via your 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 phone. And you can plug your phone directly into the camera as well because it has a USB-C kind of connector on the back. So you don't have to use the, uh, like, the wireless kind of, like, I don't know if it's Bluetooth or it's just you're building, a, you know, doing a network with the app. I'm not real sure yet because I haven't used it too much, but... Um, but yeah, you can definitely get full control of the camera through the app and through the ethernet, you can do live streaming and a whole lot of other stuff. And that's where really it gets more interesting where you start writing programs for it through, and then you're adapting it through or controlling it through ethernet. So, uh, yeah, definitely a kind of an advanced little camera. And now I know absolutely nothing about this one, but I saw it on your, on the prep sheet I got from my producer that they are also putting a time-lapse camera that captures for up to 30 days. What What is that all about? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, it has basically a long battery life. And uh, now, there's a little bit of confusion, and I'm not really sure whether this is... It, it can't actually do, like, a 30, 30 days of complete time-lapsing. You can actually... You can set it up so it has parameters, and it will last for up to 30 days. But most people don't want to shoot like you know continuously for thirty days. They probably want to shoot for like twelve hours, you know, during the day, like a construction video where they're building sure. everything. Sure, yeah. They're you know creating a model or something. So they'll be you can have it pause out for several hours and then start up again at a specific time. So, uh, but there's really no camera that has that kind of ability right now. So that made it kind of somewhat of interesting and an exciting product. Huh. And I want to round out our camera discussion with the Sharp 8K Micro Four Thirds camera. A um, lot of talk about this on the floor. And it's weird because wasn't it announced at CES? And I mean, people were kind of impressed, but I think people were skeptical. And I don't know, every review I've seen of it, people are sort of, they're cautiously optimistic. I mean, people complain about the editing being difficult, but uh, it, just generally, it seems like we're getting good response from this camera. Have either of you guys had an opportunity to test it out? Yeah, we actually shot with it in uh, in, in Las Vegas. Um, Sharp uh, contacted me a couple of weeks before the show and said, "Hey, do you want to shoot with the the 8K Micro Four Thirds camera?" And I said, "Sure." You know, is there is there any restrictions? This is really strange because most manufacturers, when they have a new camera, uh, you know, they don't want to just give it out to people and say, "Hey, do whatever you want with it." You know, because this was literally a working version that was. You know, Sharp only got this camera working one or two weeks before the show. So this was like wow. the first working version. And, you know, I went around to the booth and I, they they told me specifically, okay, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. Um, and they said, you know, go and do whatever you want with it, which is, you know, that, that's really, uh, you know, opening yourself up to, to, to criticism, especially from a very early beta camera. I mean, I think when... Uh, Eric first saw this uh, at CES. I think there was a lot of people who were thinking, oh, you know, maybe this is just vaporware. You know, maybe this is just a, a you know, a camera that they're showing that'll never get developed. But you know, t- to their to their word, they actually bought one out to well, several out to um, to NAB, 
And, uh, you know, we had to play with it and it's an interesting, you know, camera. I think it's more of a sort of a proof of concept camera at this stage. Um, they're really sort of, because they're pushing the whole resolution uh, angle here and, and that's what they're going with, it's sort of sacrificing in other areas. So because you're going for this high resolution, it's not going to be great in low light and it's, uh, you know, there's going to be some other issues with that particular camera, but you know, we took it out and there was a lot of things that weren't working with it, but you know, it still looked reasonably good this for, for early on. Um, you know, who knows how much it's actually going to cost, you know, it's going to probably be anywhere between, you know, three and a half, five thousand dollars at, at this stage. And as you said earlier, you know, the biggest problem was, um, you know, uh, dealing with the footage, you know, if you're going to sort of target this at, at vloggers or that sort of market there, you know, it's going to be very difficult for people to deal with the actual footage, even though this stuff was getting recorded, you know, we could record 8K onto a normal SD card, which was pretty impressive in itself. But then when we came to edit the material, you know, we couldn't deal with it on any of the computers. We actually had to transcode it into, uh, into ProRes files um, using Kino and then edit it that way. So, you know, it's an interesting camera. And, and I think it's funny that Sharp is the one that have come out with this um, you know, they are actually owned by Foxconn. So, you know, there was oh. talk before about, you know, Red and Foxconn developing, a you know, an 8K consumer-based camera. Well, you know, Sharp has jumped into that space. And I think in the next year or so, we're probably going to see, you know, similar offerings coming from, you know, Panasonic, Sony, and the usual suspects. What's also pretty interesting here is that Sharp is making their own sensor. That's, that's a pretty big deal, mainly because there's only, you know, Sony does 80% of the world's sensors for companies. So... They're they're filling in that space that that you know the the twenty percent that's not there. You can add Sharp to that list, and uh, from the looks of the sensor, actually, as you know, as as this functioning de- demo camera, this this prototype, um, the image actually was quite good. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot of you know things you could really you know tear tear into that. Other than the rolling shutter, it seems like that's a maybe the micro four third micro four thirds thing. Um, yeah, it was pretty. The rolling shutter was pretty bad, but you know overall, considering like like Matt said, the camera wasn't even like powering up two weeks ago before we even had our hands on it. Um, sharp's sharp's going down the right path with it. I think they have a a real opportunity to enter. And it's exciting for us as consumers because, you know, we like to have more options. And what what those options might be from Sharp, we're not really sure. I think they're just taking a, a really great temperature of what the market wants with this camera. And nobody's actually taking that temperature. I didn't, there's nobody making a camera like this. So they, uh, they kind of have a leg up on it. And, uh, you know, that's what NAB is all about for these companies. I know a lot of people get, get it confused. Like this is just a product that I can buy later. It's actually a lot of temperature taking going on with these big companies. You know, they, they want to kind of get an idea of whether or not you're excited about something. And then if you are, then those engineers and, and everybody, they're, they're going to start working really hard and heavy to to create that product for you to buy. But chances are, you know, a lot of these things, they don't even come to market and people get upset about it, but they have to understand what NAB is really all about. I have a feeling like, I, I think the, the big splash that it made at NAB, it was kind of a perfect storm between, first of all, it was 8K. Second of all, it was consumer even though we don't know how much it's going to be, but we're going to assume that it's, you know, relatively inexpensive enough for a consumer to buy. Um, and also the name Sharp, like we haven't heard that name in a while. I feel like if another camera manufacturer were used to hearing talked about an 8K camera, yeah, there'd be excitement, but there was something about the word Sharp there that sort of sparked people's interest because you haven't heard that in a while. Now that, that was really interesting too. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Any other thoughts on cameras before we move on. I feel like, you know, there's certainly a whole bunch here. There's Kinefinity firmware updates. Sony announced a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but I think in large part, all the, all the big interesting stories we covered here, um, I'd like to move on to something a little bit different. Um, I want to talk about batteries. Uh, and power, because I think there, you know, Ooh, I, I, batteries, sexy. Well, you know, it's and usually I would say, oh, let's push it to the end of the show. But you know what? Having a good battery solution is really important. The last thing you want all day long hanging off your shoulder is a big, giant, awful battery. And I think advancements in this field 
are really important. And there has been some innovation here. And I'd love to start it with the um, the B mount uh, from Ari and B Bob. And curious, you know, who who best to talk about that one because uh, it's it's very interesting. Well, I can jump in on, on, on that one yeah. if you want. Yeah. yeah, not gold mount, not V mount, B mount. Yeah. Uh, you know. What is it? Why is it well, better? If is it better? I mean, this has really been designed uh, for ARRI cameras, um, particularly some of the high draw ARRI cameras. So it's basically a, a new sort of 24 volt battery mount that they're calling B mount. So the whole idea of, about this is it can supply not only 12 volt. Um, power, but also 24 volt. So it's sort of like a two in one power solution. So it allows you to put, you know, higher uh, 24 volt batteries on there or 12 volt batteries. Now, this is a standard that basically ARRI is going to run with. So all of their future cameras uh, are going to use uh, the B mount as far as I'm aware of. So um, Bebob, which is uh, uh, another German company, they've jumped on board as well. Um, also, I think uh, Core SWX and uh, I think PAG and a couple of the other ones are all going to start making uh, B mount uh, um, options as well. So, you know, an, an interesting one, you know, moving forward. Um, I think, you know, as you were talking about batteries earlier before, we're sort of running into you know, you know, problems in, in, in a way. I know a lot of the batteries are starting to get a lot smaller and we're seeing higher capacities, but you know things are continually drawing more power and we're getting more and more accessories that we're putting on cameras and these all require um, power. So it's really going to be a struggle for battery companies moving forward to see what they're going to do. Um, you know, lithium ion isn't going to be the answer forever. And, you know, something is going to have to give and somebody's going to have to come up with some type of new powering solution, I think, moving forward. Well, this uh, FX Lion Nano 1 V-mount battery, back to V-mount, this is kind of an interesting solution because it's it's giving you some ports on it too. It allows you to power your Mac uh, via USB-C. And this this sort of sparked my interest. It's It's small, it's lightweight, it has a bunch of additional ports to it. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? And do you think this is the way that battery manufacturers are going to go to stay current and keep innovating? Oh, well, I mean, a different option, I think, for sure. This, this FX, I don't know if it's FX Lion or FX Leon. I'm not actually 100% sure with, with, with this one. But this, this one's called a Nano 1. So it's basically about the same size as a Hawkwood's 50-watt-hour um, uh, mini V-Lock battery. But what they've actually managed to do here is, as you just mentioned, is they've put in a DTAP, a USB-A, a micro USB, and also a USB-C port all on this tiny battery. So I think more than anything, this is uh, the sort of battery that's more likely to be used for people who are going to be powering other things that, um, it, you know, not cameras and traditional things that you would normally use a V-Lock battery for. As you said, you know, it's a great solution for people who are working out in the field because not only can you charge this battery using your Mac power supply, but you can also use the battery via the USB-C port uh, and power your laptop. So if you're out in the field, you know, we all have problems with the, you know, with the computers running out of power, you know, you can just hook one of these in here and then, and then, uh, you know, run it. So the guy who was showing us this was just walking around with the show floor and he had it like mounted on his belt, you know, and he was powering <laughs> his phone and things like that. So, you know, an interesting take, but it's pretty amazing that be able to make such a small battery and put all these ports in there. Yeah. I, I, batteries are so important in our world. It's just, it, you know, can you imagine like if we didn't have to have so many different types of batteries, like that would really be great, but if that's not going to happen, right? I mean, we all know that we're going to need a lot of different types of batteries to power all our devices and on, and our cameras. And another thing you mentioned, uh, Matt, was, you know, this high voltage uh, battery solution for lights. I mean, actually, this is great because our lights are, are, we don't have to like have a, basically, what do they call those? Like a tool, a tool chest battery pack, like the what area requires for, for their sky panel. You know, if you can get these high capacity, high voltage uh, batteries on a, in a V mount or, uh, you know, gold mount and just be able to clip them on the back of a, a light and run it for an hour. That'd be fantastic. Cause those, those little tool chest, uh, battery, like it looks like you're gonna, you know, you're carrying like a 45 pound, uh, suitcase to power a light is, uh, kind of inconvenient. So, uh, that's a big deal for, for the led world. Also what I, you know, this, the microing, um, or mini-izing, <laughs> 
making up words here today. Uh, batteries <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> it's early for you. It's okay. It's early. Okay, where's the coffee? Uh, but it, the, the, the NP batteries, uh, NPF, uh, the Sony L types, uh, Hawkwoods makes these uh, DV versions of them that basically they take... You know, the size of them are the same, but they're, they almost doubled the capacity of these batteries. And I can't tell you how many, I think I have about 15 different models or versions of this battery floating around in my house because there's so many devices use this battery. And I'm kind of excited about that silly little battery because I saw it at uh, IBC last year and uh, I've been like trying to get my hands on one. They finally have a they have distribution now in the U.S., so you can buy these from B&H now, and, and that's really great. But they, uh, what is it? The bigger one is like a DV975. I'm sorry, 990. It's 10,200 milliamps. It's 7.2 volts. That's almost double what the the generic and the Sony versions are at the, with the same size. Wow. So, I mean, that, that's just, to me, that's like, oh, this is great. I can power an, a, a light or a wireless system or even the uh, the Z Cam uses these batteries, so you could power that thing for probably ten hours off that battery because it's crazy that the Z Cam is actually very power efficient, even with a with a, a regular eight thousand or seven thousand eight hundred milliamp battery. That thing runs for about six hours, which is crazy. Now, another big announcement that happened just after NAB is the story that Hedge bought PostLab. Now, this is huge news. First of all, Hedge is the backup software for filmmakers that we talk about all the time. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. They just bought PostLab. Now, for those that don't know, PostLab allows teams of editors to collaborate on Final Cut Pro projects with version control, file sharing, and commenting. So all of you Final Cut Pro 10 people, like me and my studio here at BC Media Productions, we rely on programs like PostLab because this is how we communicate with each other when working on projects. So the fact that Hedge bought PostLab and are now going to be getting into this game is a huge deal because when you use Hedge, okay, here's the thing. When you use Hedge, your backups are going to be faster. They're going to be more reliable. You can import multiple sources, send it to multiple destinations all at the same time. They basically innovated and changed the entire way that you're going to do your backups from now on. Now, if they take that level of attention to detail, if they take uh, their uncompromising efforts to have things be easy and simple and effective, and they bring that to PostLab, it's going to get even better. And you know that's what's going to happen. All right, that collaboration I am so excited about, and you guys should be too, especially if you're Final Cut Pro 10 users. So that's the big news from Hedge. Of course, Hedge is a software that you should be using regardless. And if you go to hedge.video forward slash go creative show and type in go creative show at uh, check out in the coupon code, you're going to get 20% off the full license. So now is the perfect time. Head over to hedge.video forward slash go creative show. Uh, try it out for yourself. And of course, support these guys because this combination between Hedge and Post Lab is a game changer and we're so happy to have them do it. And lastly, let's talk about magnanimous rentals. Now, Magnanimous Rentals over at magrents.com. It's an equipment rental house. It's based in Chicago, but it ships everywhere in the country. Now, of course, this is a gear episode, so I'm sure you guys are just, you just can't wait to get your hands on these great new announcements. Check out magrents.com all the time because, first of all, they've got a great inventory, but they can never, ever be beaten on price. That's really where they shine. Okay, they've got three pricing tiers. That's how dedicated they are to it. If the price is in black, it's their regular price. And it's already discounted because uh, orders over $500 ship for free. So right there, you've, got, you've already got their standard discount. Then if the price is red, that's a flash discount. And a flash discount are items that are reduced extreme amounts, sometimes even as much as 50%, but it's only a limited time. So you have to book these items within the time frame that the uh, sale is in effect. So you got to make sure that if you want to take advantage of a flash sale, you need to book your dates while the flash sale is happening. And they also have dynamic prices. Now, the dynamic prices are in blue, and they're auto-lowered below regular prices, and they change every day to make sure that you get the best price. So these people are obsessed with making sure that you get the best price on the rentals. And believe me, I've used them a couple times now. I go and actually just see how much their prices would be. I, I'll, I'll put in like a, a pickup date and a drop-off date on products just to see because I'm curious. And they are always beating the prices that are out there. They're the best. So you have to head over there, magrents.com. 
mag, M-A-G, rents.com. And remember, orders over $500 will ship for free. That's over there at magrents.com. Let's jump into lighting for a little bit. Now, I mean, in past NABs, I feel like it's been all about lighting. And this NAB, for some reason, it's like all about lenses. And I want to get into lenses for sure. But before we do that, I just want to talk about the bigger lighting announcements. I know Aperture had their big dinner. And they made announcements like at this dinner, which was kind of a unique approach, I think. I haven't seen anything like it. Maybe you guys have because you've gone to a bunch of NABs. But it was like a, a smaller group of people bigger announcements at this dinner. I mean, yes, it was during NAB, but kind of a small, intimate crowd. Uh, I'm, I can only assume you guys were there at the dinner, and I'd love to hear about the big Aperture announcements. First of all, were you there? Yeah, yeah, we were there. It was, it was fun. It was good, good dinner, and, you know, it was kind of an, it was an energetic presentation. It, you know, they, they're good at that. <laughs> they enjoy doing that stuff, so. Uh, but they, they definitely were showing off. Well, what are you excited about from Aperture? Well, I think their 300D uh, Mark II is a is a big advancement in that light. I use the the 300D in a studio setting a lot, and the, the downside of that particular fixture is that the ballast has a, a fan on it that's noisy. That's really kind of the downside. Plus, it's uh, three three pieces of kit to make one light work. So you have the head, the ballast, and the controller, and then the cables in between. Um, that's a lot of, that's a lot of kit for a light. You know, I'm usually, da- I'd like to get down to just one. And that's kind of what their goal is as well, is getting their, their, their fixtures down to maybe just a fixture and a controller ballast in one. And that's kind of what they've done with the 300D Mark II. Uh, and, and they, and a lot of technology went into that, making that ballast, prettier, you know, easier to use, more functionality. You can add the, ba- you know, smaller. You can run it on one battery now if you want to, but at 50% power, where the other one you have, you have to run it with two large batteries on there. So, yeah, and it's a little brighter apparently too, which we have to test that to make sure, but they said it was roughly about 20% brighter. Um, so I think it's, that's an exciting light because, you know, bright is good, right? We want to buy lights. We want to be able to have them. They're almost too bright. So we have plenty left over in the tank if we want to diffuse them. Um, and then they have some RGB options. Their, their panel, uh, that's similar to like a sky panel looking, a fixture is advancing. It should be coming out to market soon. Uh, they've made it lighter. They basically made the ballast smaller, uh, brighter, more options, and using a instead of using a color picker, which was something uh, they kind of were showing last year, uh, it's all kind of iPhone oriented now. For you know, you can go and sample a color, and then that color will, can be put inputted right into the light. And that sort of a uh, app is also it's called Citus Link app, and they have this mesh network that's sort of taking a lot of their fixtures and combining them together so that it's almost like you're using like a DMX style thing where they're all working together. Now, whether or not that's super handy for you or not is, is <laughs> something to be debated. I don't know how many people are going to be using, you know, like, you know, 15 of their different lighting fixtures and in a scene and to be able to control them and make, you know, make like one's doing paparazzi and the other one's doing fireworks and, all that stuff. But the thing is, is that Aperture's moving more into a, a technical space. They're taking their their hardware and adding more software to them. So it's kind of exciting for them as a company to sort of it being advancing uh, in the technical world with their lighting. So that's, that's kind of cool. I also see that they're now competing with um, like a Philips Hue kind of a situation where you have a bulb that's in and of itself uh, RGB can be controllable. This aperture RC, um, there's, there's Philips Hue. And then there's also this other company. Oh, it's Lux. Lux. Oh my God. What's it called? There's another company that's kind of competing in the Philips Hue space. Um, and I just cannot remember the name, but I'll, I'll come to it as we're talking about it, but I'd love to hear about this RC because this is a very inexpensive light. Um, it basically can, just fit right into a regular light socket and uh, great for practicals on set and RGB. And uh, do you guys have any thoughts on this? I think it's kind of neat. The, uh, the application for it, like you said, is I would say it's probably more for practicals and on set. I think it has some advantages that it's, it's uh, battery powered. So you charge it up 
through a lamp socket, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> so you can, I guess you pretty much a lamp socket everywhere you go. So you might be able to power it up that way, but you can, you know, hang them. And like they were saying, you can be in the desert out at, or in the forest and then have like these interesting practicals hanging from a tree or something for a music video. I don't know. You could do, you could do, you could do some interesting things with it that I guess as a practical, uh, the the uh, Philips Hue is not really designed for filmmaking. It's designed for architectural enhancements. So having the flicker, you're going to have flicker problems if you're going to shoot in different frame rates with the with the Hue product. Yeah. Uh, so you're not going to have that that issue with this Aperture product. This thing is designed for all shutter speeds, high frame rates, all that fun stuff. But it's an interesting, and again, it also is going to work with their Citus Link. So you'll be able to control that with the colors and and all that and 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 uh, bring it into say like a bigger you know picture with like maybe ten of those right and you can decide how you want them all to to work together. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, the company I was talking about is LifeX. L I F X is that alternative to Philips Hue that I see quite a bit. It's in the Apple stores, right? It's alongside Philips Hue and. They're like individual lights. You don't have to have the whole um, Philips Hue uh, base for it. So that was what I was thinking about. But yeah, these look these look really interesting. Um, Matt, any thought on lights? I I, uh, I know on your wrap up you'd mentioned something about uh, Luxly. I just don't remember the exact product, but it's just something that interested you on the lighting front. Yeah, um, you know, Luxly bought out the the um, Timpani um, last year, and uh, it was a very impressive light. Um, you know, it's got a lot of functionality in it that we're only just starting to see other lighting companies start to introduce in their lights. So that was a one-by-one style panel. So what they've basically done is taken the, the Timpani and they've turned it into a two-by-one and they're calling it a Tyco. So all their lights are named after various um, musical instruments. So the Tyco is a, is a you know, a large Japanese Drum. So this has all the same type of functionality in it as um, as the timpani had, and um, you know, interesting light. I think they're very competitively priced. Um, I guess a lot of people are probably not familiar with um, with Luxly. Uh, they're actually a Norwegian company, um, and I remember when I first saw their lights last year, I thought, oh, if they're from Norway, they're going to be expensive, but they're actually um, very reasonably priced. So I think that's a that's a very interesting light, and the other one. Um, of course, is the light panels Gemini, uh, one by one soft. So you'll probably remember they bought out the larger two by one style Gemini, which was a fairly popular light and a, and a very good alternative to say like a sky panel. Yeah. Um, bit interesting that they left it a year to to bring out the the one by one Gemini. So basically, again, you know, just like the the what Luxley has done, the Gemini one by one is a exactly the same as the two by one in terms of all the features and uh, everything that it can do just in a more sort of compact um, one by one size uh, you know just a little bit on the expensive side though I think uh, I think it's like two thousand six hundred and fifty dollars or something along those lines so very <sighs> expensive for a one by one you know RGB light considering sort of the competition that's out there now so it'll be interesting to see how light panels goes with that one let's jump onto lenses for a few minutes and I've got to start with this multi turret it was such a bizarre thing to see. Um, I saw it wandering around at the Atomos booth while I was there. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I mean, this is really old school meets new school. It was very interesting. And, uh, well, first, let's explain it to the audience. Um, I know, Matt, you did the story, so it's probably best for you. Uh, tell us about what this is. I think a lot of people may not even understand what multi-turret is. <laughs> yeah, this was, a, this was an interesting one because um, the, the day prior – this guy called Ian, who is a, a Canadian um, cinematographer who reads our site all the time. And he came up to speak to us and said, oh, you know, thanks for all the hard work and everything you do. He goes, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've made something. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, you know, I'd be interested in, uh, in, in showing it to you. So, okay, sure. So we were sitting in the media room um, doing some editing and the next day he pops over with this camera and I was like, what is this? So basically, you know, in the old days we used to have turret lenses. So it was a way of being able to flip between different focal lengths on the one, you know, film camera instead of having to change lenses all the time. So he's taken that same philosophy and put it on, he had it on an, a, a Sony FS5, I, I believe. So basically it's a rotating turret. So he had three different focal lengths on there 
Now, this is interesting in itself, but what was even more amazing is the fact that he got all of these lenses to actually electronically communicate with the camera. So not only could you just flick between the different focal lengths, but the IS would work, the autofocus would work. And somehow, I don't know how he was doing it, he was he had a Metabone speed booster attached to the side of the camera and there was sort of a cable running up through that and then running back. So I have no idea how he actually got all this to work. But, you know, it was an interesting concept because it was designed by a cinematographer who was trying to come up to a, you know, come up with a real world solution for a problem that he encountered. He, he like us, does a lot of, um, you know, documentary shooting and things along those lines. So he doesn't want to be changing lenses all the time. And he was frustrated by that because, you know, he used to use traditional ENG style lenses. And we all know, you know, you have the the one lens on there and you get plenty of range. But as soon as everyone started to move to S35, you know, that wasn't really a, an option anymore. So this is something that he was just doing more for himself. I, you know, I don't think he was too interested in actually sort of thinking this was actually going to become a real world product and it was actually going to be selling these to the masses. But gauged by the interest, I was sort of surprised because it was one of those products where, you know, you put something up on your on the site and you either think, we're going to get two different types of comments here. Either people are going to think this is the greatest idea ever or this is the stupidest idea ever. And overwhelmingly, most people actually thought this was a good idea. And, you know, all these different sites suddenly picked this story up after we, we, we ran it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. It, it really is... It's it, well, it's eye catching. That's for sure. All he had to do was walk around, and everybody was, you know, noticing what it was. But basically, so is the thought that you're going to be able to mount just three of any lens you want, uh, obviously according to the mount, and be able to rotate between each of the three lenses on demand. I mean, the fact that the electronics go through is crazy. Do, uh, is there any vignetting? Is there any like? Uh, I just it just seems so odd to me. No, we actually have some vision on the site uh, where we actually recorded from his camera and uh, and got him to flick between them. So it's it's basically almost the sort of effect you get when you, you know, you put a doubler in on a camera almost. Yeah. You get yeah. a little bit of black sort of comes up and then the, the next focal length sort of flicks in. I mean, it's an interesting concept. And yes, you could probably go and put any type of mount on there on any system. Theoretically, I think that's that's very possible. You know, whether this is going to be a viable option, uh, you know, to use on a on your shoulder, I, you know, I don't know. And you're going to be limited, of course, in terms of what sort of focal lengths you could put on this because, you know, if you put a really wide lens and you put a telephoto, the wide lens is actually probably going to see the telephoto lens when you flick between. Yeah, but yeah, But if you're someone point. who's going into a, um, you know, maybe a war zone or you're in some very dusty environment where changing lenses is going to be a real problem... Um, you know, who knows? Uh, I, I seriously doubt this is ever probably going to come to fruition as an actual product, but, you know, I, I applaud him for thinking outside of the box. And that's what NAB is Just, for. <laughs> it's, it's to yeah. make these big splashes and do wacky things and see what happens. But who knows? There was so much interest. And it's weird because I'm looking at it. And the first thought in my head wasn't, why don't you just use a zoom lens? The first thought was, wow, that looks cool. And I don't know why. <laughs> like, it just looks really interesting. <laughs> the fact that the guy was able to make it work with the electronic lenses, with Canon lenses on a, on a, on a Sony, you know, body uh, is nuts. I mean, there's so many complications technically with this setup. But he has it working. If it was just manual, you know, old school manual lenses on their turret, it wouldn't be really that hard. You know, you wouldn't think it wouldn't be that hard to do, right? But he, no, he took it to the next level. <laughs> he went with yeah. all these electronic lenses that don't even really talk to each other as far as the body goes and the camera goes. It's like, and he made it work. And that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what NAB is all about. We always seem to find. You know, there's always this, this this person that has this great idea, and, and he's out there doing what the big companies are doing. He's sampling, you know, getting a temperature gauge of what people's interests are, and uh, that's that's some cool stuff, actually. Yeah. What else excited you guys uh, from the lens standpoint, um, Eric? Any thoughts? I know Tukina has some stuff. Of course, Sanon has uh, Canon has their um, their new line of primes. Actually, let's, let's talk about that. Cause that's kind of interesting. I think they went, Canon went a little bit of a different direction with this line of primes. Um, how do you pronounce this? Is it? Yeah, here we go. You try, you try Ben. Oh God. <laughs> is it uh 
<laughs> Sumery? No. Sumer? 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 What, what is it? Maybe. I don't know. Sumere. <laughs> Sumere. Okay. Sumere. You think I would have known that, right? I'm <laughs> from Boston. How am I supposed to use these fancy words? <laughs> I actually had a conference call with Canon um, several weeks before NAB when they were, you know, running through what they were going to be releasing. And, you know, the, they the first thing they asked was, how do you pronounce this? You know, and I think, again, it's it's an interesting one because you're going to have, you know, when even when I was at NAB, I heard the lens pronounced 15 different ways by 15 <laughs> different people. Yeah. Um, you know, interesting, but I mean, getting back to the the actual lenses, we, we're seeing another growing trend, um, particularly at NAB this year, was sort of uncoated um, or single coated lenses. A lot of these companies are now coming out with, um, you know, you know, lenses designed to take the edge off high resolution um, sensors. Yeah, and you know, interesting for Canon particularly because I think a lot of people just assumed that they were going to release the um, C and E primes in PL mount because it was really weird that they originally only ever uh, announced those those lenses in uh, Canon EF mount, and that was it. You know, obviously that was to do with the with the C the C three hundred when it was initially launched, but Canon's always been known for you know very sort of sharp. Um, contrasty, warm-looking lenses. So this is a bit of a uh, departure away from, you know, what they're known for. And, you know, they're, they're an interesting-looking lens. I mean, they virtually, in almost every way, look like the C&Es. The focal lengths are the same. The T-stops are the same. They almost look almost identical as well. Um, apparently, Canon has said they've got all new optical um, elements and it's a new optical design. You know, I don't know how true that is. Um I think a bit of a mixed reaction about those lenses. Um, so, uh, you know, in- interesting. And Tokina also had the the Vista ones. So these are based on the original Cinema Vista um, series that they unveiled. But these are a limited edition run of single coated um, versions of these lenses. Now they're only going to be available in sets. Um, so they're going to be mainly for rental houses, et cetera, et cetera. You can't buy individual versions of these particular lenses. They're going to be a bit more expensive than the than the regular ones. I had a bit of a play with them at the stand and uh, really nice. They still maintain a nice amount of sharpness and, uh, and and contrast, but also flared really nicely and had a quite an interesting look to them. And what is single coated? When you say that, what does that actually mean and how does that change the image? Well, normally with most uh, modern day lenses is that they have multiple layers of coating on the front and, and the coatings are designed to, to do quite a few different things to, to eliminate ghosting, um, to control flare. Uh, so by removing those coatings or getting them down to just one, you sort of, uh, I think Tokina's done it in a sort of smart way because there's a big difference between going from a coated lens to a completely uncoated lens. And some uncoated lenses are, you know, they're pretty crazy. You point them anywhere near any type of light source and they'll just flare all over the place and they can be hard to control more of a specialty lens. So I think by going just with a single coating, they've sort of gone that nice halfway point between a uncoated and a coated lens. So you sort of get the benefits of, of, of both. You know, flaring can be ugly. I mean, we always think about flares as as pretty little, you know, optical you know, prisms that are colorful and going across the image. When when a lens flares poorly, like you're gonna, you're basically, it looks like you just put a piece of diffusion in the front of the lens, right? It just becomes really softy white. So having a little bit more control over that could give you a, the the benefits of having nice flare patterns as well as keeping the sort of like the entire, you know, that that big whitewash of, of type of flare going on. So that's that's kind of cool. Also, Tokina updated the 50 to 135. Uh, it made it just the mechanics of it better. Uh, and that's a great lens. I actually have that one, and I use it a lot for promo because it's it's parfocal and it's 50 to 135, so it's a nice range where I can get a lot of shots in a very short amount of time. When I look at Tokina's rise and success, I almost feel like I have nothing to do with them, but I feel like I'm like proud of them in a weird way because I just remember the days and it wasn't that, well, maybe it was that long ago. I've been doing this for a while, but remember that, what was it? The 17 to 35 that everybody had or the 16 to, I still have that. 
11 to 16. (laughs) uh, That that was what, yeah, like everybody just all of a sudden had this lens and you started hearing Tokina, Tokina, Tokina. It's inexpensive. It's good looking. They have that super wide angle and they just get better and better every year. Like it's, it's really impressive to see what this company is doing. I love that. Especially, I mean, jumping into a field where you're competing against major lens manufacturers that have had decades of experience in, in uh, market share to just come out and do stuff like this is really cool. I love seeing that. The, the lens market itself is so oversaturated. There's so many yeah. people making these lenses. I don't know who's buying them. There's just, too, just I, I'm, I was kind of mind blown by how many lenses were released at NAB this year. And it seems like every show, there's just a lot of lenses. Where are they, who's buying these lenses? <laughs> they're they're $25,000 a piece. You know, they're super expensive. You know what's so crazy? I've had my, and I've talked about it on the show before. I One of the very first things I bought when I started was this set of old, like, Nikkor stills that were rehoused and declicked by a company called RP Lens. It was a set. It was like a 24, I think I, uh, I had a 24, 50, and 85, and a 135. I still love and use those lenses. I love them. And I mean, I've used them with every camera I've ever had. They have a softness to them. They have kind of a vintagey look. I'm just obsessed with them. Like, and anytime I need to rent a lens that costs forty thousand dollars, <laughs> I'm just going to rent it. I'm not going to buy it. But in, and you're right. It's like maybe the market is just rental houses. I just don't know. I mean, maybe you only make a few. So when you sell, you know, five hundred of them, it's it's a huge deal. I don't know. I don't know what the market is, but there certainly is one because they are renting huge spaces at NAB talking about lenses. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that we're seeing now too is because of the rise of all these large format um, sensors coming out, there was a serious lack of um, zooms to cover these yes. sensors. And we were seeing a lot of, we've seen tons of full frame and, and larger primes being released, but not much in the way of full frame zooms. So both uh, Fuji Non and um, also uh, Lights both re- released, uh, you know, large uh, coverage um Zooms, which was very interesting. Uh, the the Fujinon with the Premista, a bit of a strange name, but they've got a 28 to 100 T2.9 and an 80 to 250 that's going to be coming uh, later in the year. So, you know, interesting to see that sort of path being uh, being run down by uh, manufacturers now as well. Am I reading this right? Uh, Fuji, Fujifilm announced a 4K UHD zoom with an 8 to 1,000 millimeter zoom range? Yes. That's correct. Jesus. Yeah, oh, it, that's, but that's a big, that's a big, uh, that's a big sort of uh, outside broadcast um, lens. But even still, that's a pretty, uh, pretty sensational range. Yeah, ben, you can't put that one on your shoulder. Uh, yeah, th- that that's a studio <laughs> one. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the 80 to 250. That's a great range. Holy, all right, what is the Fujinon? Remember a couple of years ago, everybody was excited about the Fujinon lenses for the. Um, they were E mount, and everyone was getting them for their a- Sony. Oh, what were they? Yes, MK. the MK series. Those were great. I really like those. Did you guys play with the the one you were just mentioning, the uh, Premista lenses? Did you? No, um, I didn't. Didn't really get a chance to have a, have a, have a look at them. Um, I was sort of surprised. I was actually expecting um, the price of those to be a lot higher than what they actually are. I mean, they're still not cheap, but I think they were around about thirty eight thousand dollars each, which you know. Sounds like a lot of money, but uh, considering their Premier Series, you know, S35, they're, they're, they're sort of top of the range zoom lenses, they're, they're around about ninety to to $100,000. So it was, it's interesting to see that a lot of the prices of a lot of this, uh, of lenses in particular, are also starting to come down. Yeah. I think and the no, challenge for full frame too, for these lens manufacturers is they have to keep the weight and size down. I mean, the, for zoom lenses, these are going to be massive. Massive lenses, so uh, you know well, they'll have to come up with ways. This will probably be in the near future, but just how to make them compact enough so that you don't you don't have to you can actually be able to use them on rigs that don't require you know massive tripods and counterweights. are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. This one's called Write Your Story by Yan Perchuk. Premium Beat is the place to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. 
If you go to premiumbeat.com, you get access to a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as 59 bucks. Yeah, and it's not even the individual song because you get cutdowns, you get loop sets, uh, you get stems. And, and what that really means is you have all the tools you need to customize your track to fit your project perfectly. So it's all about finding the best song and then making it fit your project. And that's what you're able to do with premiumbeat.com. So head over there, premiumbeat.com. Check out our song of the week, Write Your Story by Jan Perchuk. And of course, all of their other great tracks as well. Premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about Shutterstock.com. Shutterstock, did you know this? Shutterstock has over 14 million royalty-free clips, many of which are in 4K. They add uh, nearly 100K clips each week. So you can only imagine. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, it might even be 15 million. Who, who knows? And the craziest thing is, is even with all these millions and billions of clips, I mean, you go to their site, you type something in the search bar, and you're faced with really high-quality, great-looking stuff. I mean, it'd be one thing if it was 15 million clips that you don't care about. It's really good-looking stuff over there. And they even have a, a new section of their site called Shutterstock Select, which is the best of the best of the best. This is premium stuff, cinematic, beautiful, made by professional filmmakers that are really known for this sort of thing. Uh, and it really does change the game. When you look at this stuff and you look at the Shutterstock Select footage, it is gorgeous. Okay, yeah, it costs a little bit more, but you get what you pay for. And here's the thing. It costs a lot less than going out and shooting something for yourself when you just need that one great shot to, uh, to really elevate your piece. That's the whole thing. You put so much work into making your project look the best that it can. When you add additional footage like this, you want to make sure it's the best. You want to make sure it's the best. And that's what Shutterstock is going to give you, especially with the Shutterstock Select Collection. So head over there, shutterstock.com forward slash video, and just check out Select, see what you think. Of course, I always suggest you go to their curated collections as well, because it's a great way to sort of uh, streamline your search process, but it's a great place to go even just to look for inspiration, because why not? So it's easy to do. Go to shutterstock.com forward slash video and check it out for yourself. I want to talk about monitors just for a moment here. Um, you know, lots of announcements here. Of course, I spent my entire week at Atomo, so I was uh, I was seeing that Shogun Seven the whole week and lusting over it. I mean, it's it's amazing the the new Shogun Seven that wasn't released yet. It's coming out in a little bit. Uh, Fifteen hundred nit monitor and recorder, like it, it's just beautiful. Um, but I didn't see much of anything else. Uh, so I'm curious what you guys um, what you guys thought out there. Any any big monitor news aside from of course the atomo stuff the uh the atom x modules and all sorts of stuff that i've been talking about all week over there but any thoughts port keys has a uh a bm5 and it's a 2000 nit monitor and it's a nice and small monitor that actually has a feature that i haven't seen before it you, with the right cable and the right camera it has an interface that you can basically control that camera through the monitor. So you tap a button and then you get you get controls uh, like record and autofocus, changing your uh, your your you know f stop, shutter speed, such like that, which is kind of an interesting idea. And uh, they've been able to incorporate that through their new series of monitors. They used to have a uh, kind of like a little breakout that went into a little breakout box where the cable would go into the monitor. Now it's all inside the monitor. So uh, that's, that to me was, is interesting. I'm actually using the BM five right now for review. And so far, I mean, that's, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's sharp. And uh, 2000 nits, I think is right. Really kind of where you step into daylight. I have a, a bright 702 small HD and it's a thousand nits. And while that is, at, for its time was like, well, this was great. I can actually use this out, do, outdoors. In direct sunlight, it does take a, a bit of a hit. But 2,000 nits seems to be kind of a great entry into that true outdoor kind of a uh, usable monitor. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on the small HD uh, announcement there? Monitor with the integrated Teradek Bolt, cap um, I guess capabilities? I don't know what the right word is there, but You've got a story on here. Who wants to who wants to talk about this? I think Small HD is certainly one of the big players out there. This was a very interesting. I think this was announced. Um, I think right on the first day of the show. So this is their new sort of top of the range series called the Cine Seven. 
So they come as either a standalone monitor or you can get what's called the Cine 7 um, RX500 or the TX500. So basically these are all-in-one um, combination monitor also integrated with a Teradek Bolt 500 um, foot uh, receiver or transmitter, depending on which model you get. So I think this is, again, a, another good direction we're seeing happening in the industry where products are becoming multi-versatile and you're incorporating everything into the one device. So instead of having to have, you know, multiple things you have to power and hook up and and, and put cables on, this is quite a nice solution because you can have, uh, say, one on your camera that's a monitor but it's also transmitting and then you can have a receiver um, somewhere that you give to your client or the director or the producer who can then monitor that exact same signal. So you can use these as multi, uh, you know, versatile products. And also they've got uh, camera control now as an optional sort of license on there. So uh, currently it's only working with ARRI cameras. So you can, the way it works is that you use the Ethernet port. So on Alexa Mini or an Alexa Mini LF or the ARRI Amira, you just simply put an Ethernet cable straight into the side of the camera and then you put it into the monitor and then you actually get camera control. Um, so you can do a whole bunch of different things on here, change frame rates, change the look, change white balance. You can start, stop, record straight from your monitor. And this is sort of a direction that small HD is moving in and they're coming out. I mean, I can't say too much at the moment, but they are going to come out with a lot more functionality for these monitors in terms of what they can control, you know, gimbals, drones, uh, lights, all sorts of things. So their whole philosophy with, with this sort of Cine 7 lineup is that it's going to become sort of a, a multi-control unit that's based on the, you know, on film sets that can basically be almost like a, you know, one of those systems you have in your home that can control the lights, can control the TV, can control the air conditioning. So that's very interesting to see the direction that, um, you know, that's happening here with all this sort of multi-integration into a single product. Hmm. Do you know, does that um, uh, Teradek uh, receiver, is that, I guess I, I'm seeing some pictures without a big antenna and some with, does it, do you need that antenna or does it just already have a receiver kind of built into it or how, how is that working? No, the receiver and the transmitter are actually built in there. They, they, they basically don't even look any larger than the normal Cine 7 style monitor. Okay. So just like so, the Focus 7 that they um, also released, um, you know, it's, it's just all built in. So you can even What is that antenna that's on there? It. That's basically for the transmitter. Oh, okay, okay. So okay. if you're using it as an on-camera monitor, that is also your transmitter. I understand. Okay. And then, or vice versa, you know, you could buy the receiver unit and just use a normal bolt um, transmitter. So it's all cross compatible with all these things. So you can use these with any of the Focus um, TX or RX products as well, or any of the bolt series of, um, of transmitters or receivers. So they've made it all sort of cross compatible. So if you've got old stuff or, you know, if new stuff comes along, everything will still work. You don't have to necessarily go out and buy everything new again. And something cool with the Atomos, um, we just mentioned it briefly a few minutes ago, but um, if you have an Ninja 5, and a lot of people do, um, they've had this new module collection called Atom X, and you can get an SDI module for that. So you can make your Ninja 5 an SDI uh, monitor, which is kind of cool. And I think, I know that they're going to be expanding that line quite a bit and making all sorts of little modules that you can add on. So I like what they're doing there. It's like, the, it seems like everybody kind of wants their monitor to do more. And I, and that's great. I mean, the more control we have, the more options we have, the better for everybody. That's for sure. Um, Definitely. And, you know, cameras are not, they're not really supplying a good EVF. They're not supplying a good LCD screen for these cameras, especially in the sub 10,000 zone, even like 8,000, yeah. 6,000. They're terrible. You actually, you have to add uh, some type of uh, external monitoring to, to these cameras. It's, and, and in, just in general, even I have a C300 Mark II. I think that they at work. And, and, you know, the LCD screen's okay. The EVF's pretty good. <laughs> you know, it's like, eh. But you still have to have a monitor. I mean, everybody wants to see what's going on on set. You know, it's kind of funny, too, with monitoring. Yesterday, I tried a, uh, a wireless transmitter system for the first time. I've never used really... I had a, a really cheesy one years ago. It was terrible. 
Uh, but this was actually a, a real uh, setup. It was the Mars, a uh, Hollyland Mars 300 or something like that. It's kind of a consumer based one. It has latency. But the liberation of getting that cable from just that one cable away from your camera to a monitor was so liberating. My producer just was 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 outside of herself. She was just so excited to not yeah. have to be right next to me all the time. And, uh, yeah, that's once it's kind of once you taste that, you really want to get wireless video going in it and and that's that's really advancing you can see a lot of companies are getting in the game and uh obviously the next iteration is going to probably be 4k to uh to transmit to these monitors so that space looks is like growing for sure teradek bolt is going 4k or has already gone 4k i see that i didn't dive into the story but i there's a little picture here with that as a as a header so it sounds like it's already happening but i just as a quick aside have any of you tried that? I think it's Teradek. I might not be sure, but the um, the wireless transmitter that can go to like up to six phones or something like that through an app. Have any have you have you guys tried that? Yeah, I have one. Oh, you do. Do you like it? Because I the big thing for it. me is I want makeup and wardrobe to have their own ability to see things. Like not have those two people, which is fine. I mean, the more the merrier. But let's be honest. Everybody's looking at the same stupid monitor, and if your client is looking at it and it's not a direct view they're going to be like, oh, why is it washed out? Why is it this? Why is it that? I want the I want the client to have the best view possible, but then I want everybody else that needs to see to have their own kind of thing. And I don't want to buy monitors for everybody. So that's something that I was thinking about getting, but wasn't sure if it works well. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I highly recommend that. It's, it's probably one of the best things I've... Um, What's it I've called? So we can add it to the list here. It's called the Teradex Serve Pro. So basically, it's just one one box that you actually attach, you know, onto your camera, and it's got either HDMI or I think there's two versions. I think there's an HDMI and SDI, and there might be one that's only HDMI. I'm not actually 100 percent sure about that. So you just run an input into your camera, and then it basically you use this free app called the Viewer app that Teradek makes, and then up pops um, that image once you connect to that Wi-Fi. So it creates its own Wi-Fi network. You just hook up to that and up to, I think it's eight or 10 devices on the one serve pro. So, you know, you can, everybody on set can actually be looking at the same image and the viewer app's actually pretty impressive. It's got just about any type of monitoring tool you can think of on there. And, you know, even if you want to as well, if you've got multiple serve pro units, so say you have four and you've got four cameras, someone can actually watch all of those four cameras at once on the viewer app. And switch wow. between looking at them, and you can add individual uh, monitoring functions to each one. So what I tend to do is, um, you know, even if I'm just using it on one camera, what's actually nice is what I'll do is I'll just mount my iPhone sometimes on my camera, and what I'll do is I'll bring up the four screen view, and I'll have say um, peaking on one of them, false color on the other, um, focus punch in on the other. And so I can see everything that's going on and I can quickly go to full screen on any of them. So just for that purpose alone, um, it's a really, really handy product. Any latency? It's very mild. Um, you know, it's not completely latency free. It's not going to be the same as, say, using a, a Bolt system, but it's very minimal. It's ve the, the latency is very minimal and it really depends on, uh, you know, the distance you're at and the environment that you're, that you're in because it's obviously using... Um, you know, Wi-Fi, but for the most part, the latency is, is pretty low. So, all right. So how, so it's using, so you need to be in a Wi-Fi area or does it create its own? No, it creates uh, its own Wi-Fi. Okay. So as soon as you turn it on, it creates its own Wi-Fi network. So all you do is you just have that, um, once somebody has the, um, the app, so anybody can just download the app for free. All they have to do is go to their list of Wi-Fi networks and pick the one that says serve pro bang. And then you open the app and then there's the camera right there. Wow. All right. Well, that's cool. I, that, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you say it works really well because I've been thinking about getting it. But, you know, you want to make sure it works before you invest. And we're, what better place to check than new shooter <laughs> to find out if something actually works? All right. So we're getting to the end of our time here. There are certainly a few more things I wanted to talk about. Um, let's jump into this um, uh, ergo rig. Uh, this is interesting to me because this is solving a problem that I think a lot of people have. A lot of, you know, camera operators have bad backs. I mean, let's be honest. It just happens. I mean, every time you turn around, someone has to have a back surgery. There's an injury. 
because the balance of their weight of the weight of the camera, just when it's handheld, it just doesn't, it's not conducive to a healthy back. And yeah, you can get easy rigs, um, but they're clunky. And this is kind of something that's interesting to me. And I'd love to hear you guys, uh, hear your thoughts on it. Uh, let's see who did, oh, Matt, you did the story. So it's all you jump in. Let us know what you think. Just like, uh, you know, Ian with the turret, this was again, another product that has been designed, um, by an actual operator. And, you know, this is where we tend to see the best products coming, uh, coming to life. It's from actual people who have worked in the industry, who've made something to solve a real world problem. So the, the guy who uh, basically came up with the Ergo rig here um, was a handheld, did a lot of handheld camera operating. So he was one of the, the main operators. Well, there was two operators on the, the series Sons of Anarchy. I don't know if you're familiar with that oh, particular yeah. show. So a lot of that show, almost 90%, I think, or more of it was all handheld. So he was doing that, you know, eight or 10 hours a day for months on end. And it basically, you know, it, it screwed him up because they were running big Alexa packages, uh, you know, on that show. So he can't do that sort of work anymore because, uh, you know, he back problems, et cetera, et cetera. So he decided he needed to come up with a, with a solution. Um, so he came up with this thing called the Ergo Rig. And yeah, I know how you mentioned, uh, you know, easy rigs and things like that, but they have their limitations uh, as well. So this is sort of looks a lot like a Steadicam vest um, in a lot of ways, very similar. And it's sort of designed to do the same thing. So you, you sort of strap it on and then it's got this um, strap that goes up over your right shoulder and it's sort of got like a hard, hardish sort of material plate. It doesn't actually sit on your shoulder. It sits just above your shoulder. And this is adjustable, so you can actually put it up higher or lower um, to tailor it to, to your sort of, um, you know, body or requirements for how you want to use it. And so it basically takes all the weight off your shoulder and your back. So you can put a great big camera package on there and sit it on your shoulder and you feel nothing on your shoulders and your back because it's transferring all the weight to your hips, just like a steady um, cam vest would do. It's wow. a very interesting sort of um, product. Um, you know, even while we were there at the, you know, doing the interview with him, there was numerous people ordering them straight away. <laughs> so I think he's actually onto something. Uh, you know, bit of a sort of a pity because of the sort of design, the way they've gone with it. Um, it's not going to work for everyone, particularly women. Um, you know, if you have a look on the website in terms of the design and the way the, that strap goes up to your shoulder, uh, you know, for, for obvious reasons, it's not going to actually be too comfortable on a, on a, on a female. So whether he gets enough demand to make another version um, you know, who knows, but again, you know, credit out to somebody who's actually thinking about solving not only a real world problem, but also like trying to reduce health risks. Um, you know, a lot of people in our industry, uh, particularly camera, uh, you know, operators suffer from back shoulder neck injuries. And, you know, this is a good way of, of trying to avoid that. Does it change the way, like, does it change the look of a handheld at all by having it slightly above your shoulder? Like, does it, does it change that look at all? Because handheld has a very specific look to it, you know? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I had a bit of a play with it. It's it's sort of hard to tell. I'd have to test it out a lot a lot more to get a definitive opinion. Um, obviously, you could you could hold it very uh, very steadily and, and and move it around. I don't know how well it would go in terms of um, walking because you don't have that physical weight on your shoulder. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure sort of whether you're going to get a lot of up and down um, if you're walking. So, you know, I don't think it's the perfect solution, but it's probably one of the better ones that I've seen. And with all this interest, it's only going to get better. I mean, it just is. We had, we had Elle Schneider on uh, the Atomos booth every day, and she was talking about it. And yeah, she had problems with it also. Um, but, I, you know, from from what she said, that the manufacturer is really looking to make this work for as many people as possible, obviously, to sell it, but also just trying to be accommodating to all sizes. And um, so it's good to see that that's happening. And this is certainly a product that people are going to need, especially when they, I mean, I'm seeing you in your picture, you've got a big, huge Aerie, uh, um camera package on here that, Jesus, if you had that on your shoulder all day long, you'd be really suffering. Oh yeah. You'd be lucky to last, you know, five or 10 minutes with that with, with, with that sort of weight on your shoulder at one time. And, you know, you, you could easily just hold this up for, for, for long periods of time. And I think it's sort of nice is that this is also a good solution because it's not actually attached to anything. You know, it's very quick to actually take this off your shoulder and then put it straight onto a tripod or, or something else. That's sort of something that's a little bit more difficult with an easy rig. 
not a lot of, I mean, there's some gimbal announcements. It's so weird. It's like, I remember the years where there was 8,000 gimbal announcements <laughs> and then 8,000 drone <laughs> announcements. And it just, the, how the, how the times have changed here. Um, tripods, anything exciting in the tripod world, uh, before we move on to audio, um, trying to think. Just, right. I mean, there's that mono, there's that sliding monopod, which was, you know, quite an interesting product. I'm not familiar with that. That was uh, the, uh, uh, what was it called? Where is it here? Mo- the was it Moza? The Moza Slypod. It wasn't in the list. Uh, the world's first oh, motorized okay. monopod. What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like that. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't on your list, so I didn't. it didn't pop up. But um, what is it? So I'm a bit hesitant to actually call it a monopod because you can't sort of really use it as a traditional monopod. You'd have to attach it to the to a base stand or something like that to have that sort of um, functionality. But what's really interesting is it's motorized. So we haven't seen this before. So this can actually be used in two ways. You can actually go um, vertically straight up or you can actually mount it via a, a built-in mount that it's actually got on, along the pole onto a tripod and you can actually do horizontal slides with it. So by pressing this little remote control, well, not remote control, but control that's on the, on the actual um, pole itself, you can actually increase the speed or decrease the speed or, or, or change how fast or slow it goes and it'll go out a certain sort of distance and then, um, you, you know, you can bring it back. Now, it weighs under, you know, one kilo, uh, you know, an interesting concept. It's got a fairly heavy payload capacity. I mean, I didn't see any vision from this, so I'm not 100% sure like how smooth it's going to be, um, but an interesting product. Hmm. Um, Eric, let's jump into audio. I know you did the story on the sound devices, Scorpio. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. This looks really cool. Um, what did you learn about it and what is it? Well, it, it's it's the next big thing for sound devices. I mean, this, this product is is loaded. They basically took everything that uh, everybody appreciates about about one of their mixers recorders and just updated it. It has all new preamps and, and circuitry. Uh, I mean, it, it's just loaded. It's like, the, I guess the real question is, is what can't it do? <laughs> you yeah. know, really? I mean, and, and, and they were saying basically too that the development of it is because uh, you know, like reality shows and a lot of um, field production that it, it has, it requires a, a lot of people involved in these and they need to be able to have more control over what they're, how they're capturing all that audio. Uh, but everything is programmable. I mean, it, it even has like, I guess it, it, it's integrated with their, their new wireless system as well. So you can have that in there. And I mean, it's, and I'm not really a big audio guy, but it, it was so impressive just to see uh, what they've, how they created this, even though all the lights on it are programmable. It's just, it's like, you can have a different color on each one of the, 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 oh, like wow. the, the pots on them, you know? Uh, so it, it's, it's just, you can really tailor this to make it uh, work for you. And it also has a lot of animation or automation options with, the uh, oh, I can't remember the name of that. Uh, it's, uh, 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 it's a strange they, these names that they have like I think it's Dante it's uh, 32 channels of Dante in and out so you can uh, control the tracks with a uh, through a through a, a board you know that's almost like it looks like in a recording studio where the pots are moving uh, by themselves because of yeah, the program yeah. to do so uh, it, it's just it's just a very powerful uh, product that they think they they put a lot of year a cu- couple years into uh, working on it so uh, it it will deliver more than uh, than you probably will ever need <laughs> and I was very excited with the road stuff um, you know I had I had a little demonstration given to me for the roadcaster pro which looks like a great option for podcasters wow this thing is very very cool uh, they've improved the problems that people had with it and it looks great. It sounds great. Speaking of sounding great, the pod mic, which was like super inexpensive. I want to say, I'm, I'm looking it up here, but I, I want to say it was like, like $150, $200 or something. It was crazy inexpensive and it sounded excellent. Um, I don't know if you guys had any, uh, any, you know, thoughts on the road stuff. Oh, the wireless go. That's another thing. Ta- let's talk about that. Cause that was kind of interesting. It's a little teeny, teeny, teeny uh, wireless lab system, I guess you could call it. I'm not hundred percent sure what exactly to call it. It seems kind of different. Um, what are your thoughts on this? 
I actually got one sitting on the desk right in front of me at the moment. So what for, what is this? Is this truly, is this like a lav mic replacement? It's like, I love the receiver, but I didn't like the transmitter. Like the transmitter's too big. The receiver's too small. Um, if, and maybe I'm wrong, but doesn't it, don't you have, do, isn't the transmitter the, the microphone too? So you can't like separate the microphone from the transmitter or am I wrong? No, no, two different, two different things. I mean, th- this is sort of aimed as a entry level wireless system. Um, you know, everybody liked the, uh, the road link system. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's, but it's big and it's, you know, for the sort of audience they were targeting that at, I, th- I think, you know, it, it was, the product was actually a little bit too large considering, um, you know, the type of cameras a lot of people were using that with. So they've come up with this new entry system called the Wireless Go, which is, you know, supposedly supposed to be the world's smallest wireless microphone system. And that's probably a pretty legitimate um, claim. So just like the, uh, the, the Rode Link system works on the 2.4 gigahertz digital transmission um, system, so you can use it anywhere in the world. Uh, then this is very sort of plug and play. There's no menus on this system whatsoever. All you do is you turn one on and you turn, you know, you turn the transmitter on, you turn the receiver on, and then basically it's ready to go. The only, uh, phys- I think there's two buttons on there. One is to, to link it to another product. Um, I think if you've got multiple ones and there's a gain setting, that's it. So there's like zero DB, um, I think minus six and minus 12, I think DB settings on there. And uh, it's got a 3.5 millimeter, I think the TRS uh, output on there. And the actual transmitter, uh, now this can be used in two ways. It's actually got a built-in microphone in there. Yep. Which is, uh, which is quite unique. So you can actually just use that if you wanted to. So, you know, you're going to have to put it on somebody and it's going to look pretty ridiculous because they're going to have this big box. Well, I mean, I guess it's not big, but in terms of what a normal lapel would look like, it's pretty big. Yeah. So if you were just doing, um, I guess, corporate things or uh, stuff where it didn't matter visually that something was on there, um, you know, the microphone would work that way. Or you can actually just, it actually has an input in there as well. So you can use a lapel microphone. So any sort of, um, you know, Rode makes a few and some other companies. So if it's a TRS or a... um, just a 3.5 mil jack microphone. You can put it on there and then use it um, as a lapel. So I've done a bit of testing already, and uh, you know it, it, it's not too bad actually. I was actually surprised by the quality of the inbuilt microphone. I tried it and compared it against uh, one of the wireless, um, well, the same lapel microphone that comes with the Rode Link system, and I actually found that the inbuilt microphone on the Go sounded better than that one, really, which, which was a little bit surprising to me. And I actually sort of had a bit of a think about it and thought. You know, this might be not an in, not a bad actual thing just to use for other purposes other than what it was sort of intended for. Um, you know, I can imagine a situation because it's got that built-in microphone in there. Uh, you know, you could just go and place it down somewhere when you were when you were shooting, and then uh, use it to pick up sort of ambient audio. Or you know, even if you've got a camera that can record multiple tracks of audio, uh, you know, there might be a situation where you could just clip that on yourself and actually be, you know, talking and actually giving the editor, um, you know, advice or tips as to well, what you're actually shooting or um, saying this was a, you know, shot at 635 in such and such or whatever, or this was the settings, blah, 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 and just use it as sort of like a, a, a scratch track to put information on, um, you know, if the audio is not critical uh, coming from the camera and you're getting audio recorded somewhere else. So, you know, for one hundred ninety nine dollars, it's a it's it's quite an interesting sort of product. I'm glad you can plug in another mic because that that was the thing that got me nervous because I only saw it for a, a moment. Um, actually, Rodney Charters came to the booth; he had it on, and I didn't realize you could plug a mic into it. So you do see like he had this big box on him. I was like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> like, I, I love the receiver part because it's small and lightweight, but I didn't like having to use the box as a microphone. So I'm glad that you don't have to do that. Um, all right, we are really down to the wire here. And uh, lightning round, uh, anything else on the audio side that's important for us to mention? Because I we've got to talk about this crazy Resolve editor keyboard. It just has to be it has to be brought up. But anything on audio for you guys before we wrap up here? I wouldn't mind adding something. A de- deity is kind of popping up. Oh yeah, pretty fast. Yeah. Um, this this is this is a little side shoot company from Aperture that is no longer just some little side shoot company from Aperture. They've really 
uh, are starting to put out their products. And well, I think the reason why they're, well, the reason why they're doing this is because now they have their own factory space. So they're not sharing Aperture's factory space, which is a big deal for them. So they're going to be able to get more microphones built, get them out to the market. And, uh, and their pricing is pretty uh, incredible. So uh, they have a brand new, well, it's not brand new. They're, they have a connect. It's like a dual receiver wireless audio system that is uh, super affordable. I think it's $700 for a dual system, now a uh, wireless wow. system. So, and it has great range. So it, it, it's, a, it's an impressive product that will probably going to do, that's, that's going to do really well for them. And then they have three new microphones. All of them are under $300, even some around 150, 170. Uh, small lapel mics, different ranges. Uh, so they're doing some exciting stuff. Keep your eye on them. Uh, give them a try. I'm hoping to get one of their, um, their, that dual receiver wireless system in for review. Uh, there's just, they're just backed up trying to get them out to people. <laughs> so hopefully we'll have one here in the next couple months to play with and uh, do a review on. But yeah, it's a, it's kind of cool to watch those guys grow. I saw a bunch of them floating around on the floor. I think they were giving a lot of their um, like uh, DSLR, uh, you know, uh, camera top microphones um, to vloggers and YouTubers and stuff. Cause I saw them, saw a lot of people just kind of doing their own vlog and YouTube show with deity on the side. And I, it was a brand I hadn't been familiar with, but all of a sudden now I am because I saw them everywhere at NAB. So I had no idea they were tied to Aperture. That's interesting. Yeah. The, the Aperture used to have an audio line. The a was one of them. Um, uh, and they decided to, you know, have, uh, have this, uh, as a real company and separate them from, you know, Aperture used to do a lot of things <laughs> they don't do anymore. <laughs> so uh, huh. I think that that's, that's kind of an interesting, you know, a lot of the Chinese companies, they, they kind of like, why can't we do this? Well, they want to make everything right. And they want to make a lights and audio and, uh, you know, gimbals and all this. And I think we're starting to see these companies, uh, actually decide to specialize, you know, be really, really good at one thing or two things, not seven or eight. And, uh, Aperture is one of them. It's kind of focusing themselves. Oh, you know what's really funny, Ben, is uh, where did all the drones go? You remember, like, at, at NAB, even last year, the yep. drone pavilion and yep. drone sounds going through the entire hall? I think I saw one drone company in uh, in the hall and no DJI, right? Did you, did was they Were they even there? I didn't get to roam the floor, but there was a lot of talk about the lack of DJI presence and uh, the lack of drones in general. It's like... Is the market oversaturated? Are there just more strict laws now? What is going on? Because it just, I don't know. I think maybe just people bought them, used them, and are kind of over it. I'm not i am not totally sure. Because from my standpoint, there still is a demand for drone um, cinematography. I mean, we get calls all the time for stuff like, oh, can you throw in a drone shot, this and that, we need an exterior, yada, yada. People are asking for it, but I can't just go and get one and use it and be paid for it because you have to have, you have, to have a license. So- I mean, I'm hiring out to do that, and it's not an investment I really want to make right now. I think that's exactly what is happening. I think that, you know, people aren't going to just—they're not toys in, at NAB. They're, maybe they're, they're toys at Walmart. You can buy them. You can buy them at the toy store, but you can't you really use them professionally without being certified and licensed, and they're getting stricter on these things. And so if it's an investment and it's time, right? So I think that the sales of those are probably going to be affected uh, in the smaller space. Now, you know, globally, you know, I'm ta- we're just talking about the U.S. I don't know what it's like in Japan and in Europe and, and, and how the rules are uh, in different places. But uh, I, I do think that that's probably a big reason. And plus, you know, the DJI does kind of have that cornered pretty well. I mean, they're they're not they're not perfect. They will fall from the sky. But we saw, you know, we we've seen other companies attempt to like uh, like uh, GoPro, you know, trying to make a, a drone that failed pretty miserably. Uh, and, you know, so I think that reliability and things that go wrong with something that's in the sky <laughs> is a uh, pretty. You have to really be good at what you do, and uh, you know, that's probably. Another reason why the the market's thinning because it's just a liability to have this thing falling out of the sky, you know. So you have to make a good product. I think the last time I heard the last time I'm not really thinking about drones very often, but the last time it was in my forethought was um, Mavic Pro 
which I know you were excited about, Matt. You did a big review on it. Um, that's kind of the last time I really heard any big drone news that got me particularly excited. I don't know. Maybe just people have them. They're over it. I'm not. Who knows? But one thing they're not over is keyboards from the 1990s. Uh, if, if you if you're doing a period piece <laughs> and you need a thousand dollar prop keyboard. Um, now, this is really interesting. Never in a million years did I think everyone would be talking about a keyboard from Black Magic, but they they're they're really putting a lot of effort and focus into their editing platform, certainly Resolve. And this keyboard is a thousand dollar keyboard for Resolve. And um, I guess you can do that when you give away software for free. That's that powerful. Love to get your thoughts on this. Well, I think it's interesting. Uh, we all know that, like you just said, Resolve and uh, any of the any of the software that Black Magic is making, you know, they want to sell hardware. So it's not a surprise that they have this this keyboard. But I do like the idea. Uh, a lot, it's yeah. very polarizing as far as pricing goes because the, I think a lot of people were very negative. Like, what well, this is a nine hundred dollar keyboard, a thousand dollar keyboard for Resolve this is ridiculous. You know, I can put rubber, you know, a coating uh, with color codes on, on my keyboard just fine. But you know, having the ability to edit with two hands. Uh, and having a shuttle wheel, I could see this being an enticing uh, tool for full-time editors, especially. Uh, and it, yeah, it, I didn't even realize how close it was to uh, that actual Sony controller. It is. I think there's only maybe two or three buttons that aren't uh, placed in the exact same place. So anyone that was editing back in the linear days uh, and, and is unresolved probably had a, had a had, you know, their eyes probably opened up when they saw that keyboard. I honestly think it's brilliant. It's ridiculous. The look of it is crazy. It got everybody talking. Uh, and, and the best part about it is you don't like, yeah, it can be polarizing, but you don't need it. Like if you don't want it, just don't buy it. You can still use resolve. <laughs> exactly. You know, what's the big deal. And for professional colorists that are making untold hundreds of dollars an hour, this is going to be paid for in two seconds. And if they really want to get it and use it, like go for it. Like, I think that's what's so interesting to me is they they made it super expensive. They made it for a very small market, but it doesn't it doesn't change your ability to still use the software, which you can get for free. So it's like, what what do you want from these guys? <laughs> the software is the important part, and you can go use it right now. I, I thought it was really cool. I thought it was a very interesting way to make a splash at NAB. And let's be let's be honest, if you can make a splash at NAB, uh, that's impressive because there's a lot of people vying for your attention. Yeah, and it's built. The thing was built like a tank. I mean, it was surprisingly, surprisingly durable. So it doesn't feel like, you know, some Amazon keyboard. You know what I mean? It it really felt like it's built to to withstand, you know, a lot of a lot of editing. And in people that are bouncing in and out of color grading and and doing, you know, your your full on editing, video editing. Uh, this is going to appreciate these kind of hardware tools to bounce around in. So you can go from your editing in, in DaVinci Resolve, you're, you're assembling your videos, and you have all these shortcuts, and then you can bounce over to the color page, and you know, you have your, you'll have your three balls over on the other side with the controlling and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's like flying the spaceship and uh, anything that can make your job easier, especially if you're a full-time editor. I mean, that this stuff is overkill for me. I don't, I don't, I'm not a full-time editor. I'm a 50-50 guy, and but I can understand just having having this uh, these kind of panels and hardware to make your software just flow is super important. Well, there is plenty more on NewsShooter.com. We only scratched the surface. I mean, in your wrap up, there's like 50 something articles, and you guys are always pumping out new stuff on the daily basis anyway, and we really appreciate that. But uh, wow. It was, a, it was a big year. It was a good year. And um, so glad to have you guys on to talk about your experiences. So thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Ben. There you go. NAB 2019. What an episode. Wow. So much to discuss here. And honestly, we haven't even scratched the surface. There's still so much more. So I strongly encourage you head over to newsshooter.com and check it out for yourself. Read up on these stories and see. I'm sure by now, by the time you're hearing this, there's probably even more out there from newsshooter.com on NAB. So check it out. Now, you know what else you should check out is gainstructure.com. Why? Because that's the website for Matt Russell, who mixes and masters and makes this show sound so good. He can do the same for you. 
You know, I use him as an audio mix to picks for my production company, BC Media Productions, and he does such a good job there, too. So you can hire him for yourself, for your own projects. And I suggest you do over at gainstructure.com. And while you're there, head on over to gocreativeshow.com. Check out our past episodes and check out our survey. If you fill out that survey, you are automatically entered to win a $100 gift card at B&H. So you can maybe buy some of the stuff that we talked about today, or at least you know, throw some money into it. But why not? Who doesn't want a free gift card? Who doesn't want free money? And it's simple. You just tell us what you think of the show and the survey. How easy is that? And lastly, our sponsors, of course. We've got Hedge.Video, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Shutterstock.com, and Premium Beat. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. So please, support those that support us.